So good morning and welcome to MGH Neurology Grand Rounds. My name is Becky Williamson. I'm one of this year's chief residents and it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Tracy Cho. Dr. Cho needs very little in the way of introduction as former partners neurology resident and chief resident, advanced general neurology fellow, former director of the partners neurology residency program and former director of the MGH Neuroinfectious Disease Unit and Autoimmune Neurology Unit. I'm sure this room is filled with many of his prior trainees who could confidently say that they owe much of their clinical and professional development to his mentorship. Dr. Cho is an expert in neuroimmunology and neuroID and literally wrote the book on neurorheumatology. In 2018, he sadly moved to University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine where he has expanded the neuroimmunology department and started a registry and biobank of patients with neuroimmunological conditions to provide invaluable resources for advancement of the field. A dedicated teacher and advocate for diversity and inclusion, he has received many commendations, including Partners Program Director of the Year and Neurology Faculty Teacher of the Year at his, at his new post at University of Iowa. We're so excited to welcome Dr. Cho to give our annual lecture on medical education. Dr. Cho, we wish you could be here in the ether dome with us, but please know you're welcome back to visit anytime. You can take it away. Thanks so much, Becky, for the lovely introduction and for the invitation. I was indeed sad that things turned out uh, the way they did and I couldn't be there in person. Um, I miss everybody there um, and think of you often. I was um, telling the Brigham audience yesterday that I think I'm more nervous for this audience than I am for uh, any other talks that I've given uh, nationally, um, just because all of my teachers, uh, it feels like I'm uh, presenting back to my teachers and my family. So, um, I do want it to be a little bit different than the traditional uh, Grand Rounds one-way uh, discussion uh, or one-way presentation. I'm hoping to engage everybody in um, discussing some of the educational scenarios that I've encountered over the years. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, Becky, it looks like I need to be given privileges for that. All right, just one moment. Dr. Greenberg poking at me on the side chat already. I am indeed nervous, particularly for you. Okay. Um, Here we go. Um, I promise this isn't the first time I've presented on Zoom. All right, here's the, uh, Becky, can you see the slide? Yes, looks good. Okay, so um, here's the obligatory um, disclosure slide with the code for your CME. So learning objectives for today are listed here. I'm not gonna dwell on those. We're just gonna dive in. I will say that the scenarios I'm going to present are um, based on some of my own experiences, but also uh, several that I've heard from other colleagues, uh, both back in Boston and around the country. Many scenarios are similar and have been folded uh, at multiple institutions over multiple years. So I'm gonna jump in with uh, a case. As you probably remember from many presentations that I gave back in Boston, I really think best by working through cases to build general principles from individual examples. Um, so a senior resident or a fellow or faculty new to the role in the position of supervisor and teacher to a range of learners 
with different levels of experience. They feel insecure in their knowledge and skills to effectively teach and lead their team. They feel pressure to portray confidence and broad medical knowledge. They fear questions or situations that may demonstrate the limits of that knowledge. Um, I definitely have felt this many times over my career and um, anyone have thoughts on whether you have felt this yourself, how you approach this or advice you would give to someone else feeling this way. And I am gonna open my list of participants. I know it's uh, not typical to have audience participation. Dr. Greenberg, since you picked on me, um, <laughs> thoughts on, on how you would advise someone or whether you've ever felt this way before? Yeah, yeah Corey, I mean, both sides, uh, the, that you wanna look smart if you're, you, you, you're, you're worried uh, everyone's gonna see through you, the only guy who doesn't know stuff, everybody else knows stuff, you're the only one who doesn't, and you're, you're sure everyone's gonna see through you. So uh, having, conf you know, trying to instill confidence that, uh, yeah, ac actually everybody feels that way. We, you know, we all know a lot about something and less about something else. And uh, that's, you know, that's, uh, we're, we're here to learn from each other. Um, and uh, the challenge of keeping people engaged regardless of their, their background is really hard. Um, you know, trying to pitch teaching points to people with different levels of knowledge and realize that, you know, half the people are bored while you're teaching at the right level for somebody else or, or, or the other half of people have no idea what you're talking about, um, but trying to individualize it. But any, any, anyway, we're all, we've all been in this boat, I think, uh, you know, a thousand times. Um, I can think of one specific venue where I felt this as a resident, uh, Friday mornings at 730. <laughs> um, and I think I, actually am very grateful for the uh, experience and the challenge to put your dime down. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I tried to tell residents uh, in preparing for a brain counting conference is um, Dr. Headley White and Dr. Frosch uh, really care about you learning. That's why we have the conference. And the only way we know where you're at is to um, put you on the spot and put your money down. Um, anyone else have uh, had this feeling or approaches to how uh, you could advise, let's say a, a new senior resident who's feeling particularly nervous about taking on a teaching role? Teacher, I could chime in. Um, hi. <laughs> Um, having been an attendee now for all of seven days, I, I totally like this is like I'm living this every uh, second of attending, um, just feeling so overwhelmed with the fact that um, this is such a new transition to me. And I oversee like critical care anesthesia fellows who clearly have a very different background and training and know a lot more than me in certain scopes. And I found in the last week what really um, one of the ways that was sort of effective was to leverage different people's knowledge and have different fellows teach the medical student and have, you know, have the medicine, uh, the medical student take the first crack at something and then say, you know, neuro ICU fellow, do you want to chime in on this or critical care fellow? Like you're coming from a different background and how do we sort of actually like taking the pressure off myself to teach everyone and like, um, sort of distributing that um, experience through the different ranks of people and, you know, chiming in at the very end if there was something else to add, but really like relying on the sort of collective knowledge of the group, because it is incredibly intimidating to be the new attending. Dr. Albin, thank you for chiming in and for making uh, use of the new opportunity for alumni to join Grand Rounds, um, we miss you. Um, I, and I appreciated that uh, text you sent me a while back uh, that you were uh, working with another alumnus uh, in the ICU at the same time. Um, so that is a great point. The engaging multiple levels of learners uh, to help teach each other is a great way 
to make sure you're hitting everybody's experience level and engaging more senior trainees to uh, participate and build their teaching skills. Anyone else want to chime in about their approach? Tracy? Yes. Matt. Dr. Frosch. Um, good to see you. Um, I think the, um, the thing I would say is that I think in some part you have to separate out the sort of overseeing care from teaching. Because I think, you know, in one sense, overseeing care, yes, it's a responsibility that that's, that's yours and you need to know when you need help and the like. But in terms of teaching, I think the real value in teaching is not just sort of, you know, sharing what you know, but the fact that as part of that discourse, you, the reason you teach is because people will ask you questions that force you to think about new things or, but, you know, I, when I teach neuroanatomy, you know, I get asked questions about things that I haven't thought about and that I don't know and give me a way to sort of figure out how to both go and learn. Turns out there's some things that actually aren't in there. You know, anybody want, anybody here tell me, you know, which is a question I get probably once every three years. Where's proprioception for the tongue handled? We all know where our tongue is in the mouth. And we talk about other proprioception for the face and the you know principal sensory nucleus of five and never talk about proprioception for the tongue. And it's a you know it's one of those things that you don't have an answer to, and those sorts of things are what mean makes teaching actually an exchange rather than a sort of you know equivalent to just handing out a book. And so I think encouraging people to see that instructional role as bidirectional is really important, so that you're not flustered and ask a question about something you don't know. Thank you. That those are great points. Um, I likewise uh, when teaching neuroanatomy or the neuro exam and and you get these questions you know the why questions um and like some of them are evolutionary some are teleologic um but what i got from what you just said is uh a great point and that is uh the importance of role modeling that you are also learning from the process and there are things that uh there are always things that you don't know and but you're going to go find the answers or the best answers you can. So I think you all hit on many of the things that I was thinking. Um, I think it starts with just building trust and mutual respect. So you would be amazed at how many times trainees, uh, the, their teachers don't learn their names and they are the, psych intern or the you know fill in the blank the the medical uh rotator so just taking a moment at the beginning to learn their names what their background is you may have someone who's done you know a postdoc in whatever area the particular topic is in and has gone back to to be a, a medical trainee so it starts with building trust um I find it very helpful to set expectations and ground rules, particularly in teaching in the clinical setting where you do have to balance the clinical care and the uh, um, discussions with patients and their families along with the teaching. I, particularly when I first started, I would go over every MRI for every RDA patient before round. So I knew exactly where I was gonna focus. Um, as I got more experience, I got more comfortable with discovery rounds. And I think you learn something or can teach something differently by how you think through something from scratch versus um, having been prepared. But I would make no uh, pretense about that uh, You know, when I was first attending. And I encourage the senior residents um, to, you know, you, you have more experience and knowledge to begin with but that also means you need to uh, know exactly where to focus things to keep rounds efficient, for example. Um, as uh, Dr. Frosch mentioned, uh, just being open to saying, I don't know, but I will uh, think about it or talk to some other smart people and, and find out some answers. And then another thing that in particular can be challenging for high achieving uh, partners or MGB as we're called now residents um, is acknowledging that not everything's black and white. There's not always one right answer. 
So acknowledging the gray zone, particularly around um, clinical or uh, scientific topics where there's not a consensus. Even when there is a consensus, sometimes the consensus changes 10 years later with a new trial. Um, so I try to, to role model that. And um, like Anish always said, um, role modeling uh, CMF, you should have a very low threshold to seek input from other experts. That's how we all learn, but also how the patient gets better care. So I'm always open to, to other input on a, a case in that regard. All right, I'm gonna move on to uh, another scenario that may sound familiar, familiar to those of you who served as chief residents or have been uh, faculty mentoring um, on RDA or CMF. A senior resident feels that the junior is not pulling their weight and takes a tough love or hands-off approach. Overnight, the junior sees 10 consult consults and the senior supervises, but does not take on any of the consults. The junior resident feels that the senior should have stepped in to help but the senior replies, I had to do all the consults overnight as a junior and it taught me independence. Both come to you with their perspective asking for help. Dr. Cole, nice to see you. Gracie, how are you? Dr. Good. Cho, Professor Cho. <laughs> um, Andy. Um, have you ever had a, a team where something like this happened or, or experienced it yourself back in the day? Um, I probably experienced it. Well, no, I don't think I experienced it in the day. Uh, um, um, my residency was relatively humane, believe it or not. Um, and I don't know that I've seen it floridly like this, but it certainly, certainly does happen. Um, you know, I think, I think one of the things I'm reflecting on as I'm listening to you, Tracy, is how over time our approach to teaching has changed uh, from perhaps being more hierarchical and top down to more hands off to now more uh, team based and supportive. Uh, and um, uh, uh, thinking about individuals beyond solely their neurological or, or technical expertise. Uh, as you know, as people who are struggling to do the right thing, and, and how do you help them with this? Um, you know, these lines of responsibility between seniors and juniors are, are tricky, and uh, they're 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 um, location dependent. I think the rules in one institution are not necessarily the same as the rules in another institution. So that tells me that there's probably room for many different models. This sounds pretty cold-hearted uh, to me. And um, I don't think I could see 10 consults in a night. I can't imagine how anyone else could. So it seems like, you know, there's a pretty clear case for help here. Um, and the, uh, uh, the sort of response at the bottom of the slide seems a little, a little cold and cruel to me. So, I, you know, I think, I think the long-term relationship would be a heck of a lot better between these two individuals if the senior stepped in and said, hey, let me give you a hand, uh, even, even if it was pretty trivial contribution, just the spirit of it. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think that we wouldn't see this sort of approach very often anymore, uh, although it was common uh, in the past, for sure. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I definitely exaggerated it a little bit, but this flavor, um, I can tell you as a program director, was, uh, you know, I had this conversation twice a year at least. Um, and I've had it here in Iowa as well. Same flavor, not the exact same scenario. Um, but absolutely, I, I think I take an approach with the more senior person in this scenario of um, the long-term, you know, what is what are you hoping to achieve in the long-term? And, um, pointing out the, the relationships and that we work as teams. And, um, you know, there are always times when you need to be flexible and the roles are not black and white. Uh, Dr. Plotkin. Yes, I wanted to say something. So thank you for calling me. I wanted to get your take on one thing. I think you're bringing up for me, which is one of the most important things. And that is 
establishing and maintaining a culture in an institution. It's something I've been thinking a lot about with this MGB discussions that are going on and how do you maintain what I consider to be a very special culture we have in the MGH neurology group. And, um, you know, what you're addressing here is that team approach that you have on your individual team, but it has to be embedded in this larger group. And that's why leadership among uh, some of the senior members and really throughout the entire department is so important. And that's something we have to struggle for all the time. In this case, of course, it's this concept of a team being more important, you know, than, than this exercise here of I did it this way, you have to do it that way. So to me, that's what's important about this case. Thank you. Absolutely. So it, it definitely is embedded in a larger culture and the leadership has a large role in how, what, what kind of tone is set. And, um, and this is a teachable moment. This is the person who might need to understand, take that step back and say, you know, we don't talk about the culture a lot, but let's talk about what culture we want to have here, you know? And so that's part of this teaching, not just, uh, not just the individual <laughs> episode, so to speak, I would say. Tracy, uh, it's David Kaplan, the way you framed this, uh, the, the, the senior residents kind of uh, sidestepped an important part of the problem. I mean, the senior resident here is told the junior that it's good to do all this work because it teaches you independence. But in fact, there's a, a feeling that the senior has that the junior is not pulling their weight. And that kind of raises the question of how you give uh, negative feedback or corrective feedback uh, not just about knowledge, but about uh, assuming responsibility. Uh, it may or may not be a good idea for a junior resident to do all 10 consults and become very independent, but there's a separate issue here that the senior hasn't addressed that's hard to address. I'm wondering if you could comment on that. So that is a great uh, point. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kaplan. Uh, it's nice to see you, David. Um, so. I absolutely uh, engage the more senior trainees in this kind of scenario in um, effective mentoring. And uh, one of the things that I point out is that um, it's kind of irrelevant how, how someone did it when they were in the position because uh, no one trainee has the exact same skill set and the uh, exact same scenarios. And that uh, there's a range of efficiency, knowledge, skills, and the job is to try to get everyone closer to, you know, to the skill set and um, the kind of doctoring that um, we want them to have. So I often will go back to, so what, what is the goal? What is your goal here? Um, first, I will point out the patients need to be cared for. So I don't give a crap what you did when you were a junior. You need to take care of these patients. And if your junior is struggling to do that, it's your job to, to help get it done. Um, so kind of coming from a taking a step back, what is the end goal that you're wanting to achieve here? Another goal is for this junior to succeed and be able to, to become a senior who's effective and ultimately to be a, an effective neurologist. So what... Um, I don't have a formula for how uh, a senior could do things differently in this case, but taking, you know, bits of what everyone has said, um, pitching in, showing that you are willing to get your hands dirty and knowing when to do that. And then knowing when it's, uh, I got a little pushback with this yesterday, um, actually about um, the flip side of micromanaging and not letting someone develop, you know, the independence that they need. Obviously, this is not even anywhere close to, to that, but um, engaging the, the senior in this situation to think about how they could get that uh, point about developing independence, but also make the junior feel supported and want to come back and work harder with, when working with that senior. Um, so that's kind of a vague answer. I am going to go to the next slide to go through some of the things I thought about, many of which were brought up. 
So again, seeking common goals, patient, outstanding patient care and outcomes, um, a culture where we support each other while we're working very hard to achieve that patient care and learn. Um, again, pointing out that you know, different uh, people approach scenarios differently and they have different backgrounds and some people need to stop and think more. Some people uh, are more efficient and won't need as much support. You can't really apply the same mentoring approach to every single trainee because different trainees have different needs. So being flexible. Um, Albert Hung uh, was my attending on RDA when I was a senior early on uh, in my senior year. And uh, there were times when I was doing all the family meetings and uh, he was watching me do all the exams. And then there were days where he would just, just take uh, initiative and say, Tracy, I, why don't you let me do this family meeting? I think uh, the juniors need your help with you know, these three patients. Um, and, and then I was in a mode of just like getting stuff done um, and he was taking that burden off of me, not because I couldn't handle it. He knew that I had experience with family discussions and I was needed elsewhere. So um, I learned a ton from Albert, but uh, one of the takeaways I had working with him is just, there was no one role he played every day. It changed depending on the needs of the team, the patient, you know, there were learning points that required more examination. There were other learning points. Um, same thing, uh, Andy, uh, you would sometimes talk for an hour about a case and for other cases, it was like five minutes and uh, not every situation is the same. Um, again, that relationship building that you were talking about of working with this person over time, um, is it worth pushing the tough love to extremes when uh, that may erode that uh, trainees trust and sometimes stepping in once, even if you never do it again, goes a long, long way for building the, the relationship. Um, I put this little uh, quote in here. I don't know. I was trying to see Jorg. I'm looking for other people who are residents with me um, on the call. I didn't see if Nick Day was on here. Um, I used, when I came on as a senior, I would, uh, at five o'clock, you didn't always know who your senior was going to be because it, it changed each night. I would send a page, hi, I'm your senior tonight, call me if you're weak. And it was a joke, uh, a lot of machismo, um, but I could do that because they all knew I absolutely would want them to call me if they needed me and they knew I was joking. Um, but it was also a little bit of a nudge to like take a stab at it first before you call me. Um, so I think I can, I could do that. I like to think, and Jorg and others could speak up if they felt otherwise, um, that they knew the kind of, uh, senior resident that I was. Um, and that was kind of my way of, um, checking in, but also, you know, encourage them to, to take a stab at things. Yeah, the, the, I like that, that point. I think uh, that, that creates the trust that you want. And I think one other aspect is uh, where perhaps both goals could be achieved uh, from your previous example uh, of creating that independence uh, to tackle 10 cases, but also feel uh, that there's a safety net. If the senior would say, I'll let you do this, but you call me if you need help and I'm gonna step in. And I bet a lot of uh, residents would feel the pride to say, let me see if I can tackle that. Uh, and, but if I really break uh, or things get unsafe for the patients, then I know who to call. And so in that case, both have achieved their goal. Uh, and, uh, and that is an educational point. Thank you, Dr. Dietrich. Um... All right, I'm gonna move on to another case. Um, a trainee, a student or resident appears to struggle with basic concepts or situations. You provide feedback on a case-by-case -case basis, which seems to be well-received, but the behavior and performance does not improve. So even at man's greatest hospital, 
this uh, sometimes occur. It occurs in every setting, everywhere. Um, anyone have thoughts on, on how to approach something like this? I, for that matter, this could be a faculty who's struggling. Um, anyone want to take a stab at how you might approach this or some general principles? I think it depends, Tracy, on on how um, how invested you are. And by you, I mean whoever is the person trying to solve this uh, in the individual's ultimate success. And by definition, when we hire individuals to be residents here, we're automatically pretty heavily invested in their success. So this isn't a situation that's easily fixed. Uh, if there's sort of a basic competence problem. Um, and I think we've all experienced working with individuals who have had this challenge. I've seen a lot of different models ranging from kind of write them off and just sort of patch the quilt with someone who can manage the job and, and, and move on, which is not a constructive solution to providing extra support, extra counseling, uh, extra teaching, extra coaching, whatever you know, adjective you wanna use or whatever verb you wanna use uh, to try to help the person get, get to a higher level. Um, one thing that I wonder about, uh, just as you're asking the question is, is there ever a place for like creating, maybe not a formal, but an informal buddy system for this person, pairing the, pairing the individual with somebody who's uh, able to, has the bandwidth to be helpful uh, in addition to doing their day job. Um, obviously it, it can't be overt, like, you know, you have to be careful how it's done, but, um, uh, and uh, it's a super hard problem to solve because we all do end up sooner or later with a trainee who just isn't fully up to the job. And, and we have a hard time seeing ways that we can ever get the individual to that point. Um, uh, but I think, the, I think the extra support concept is the one that's really most operative here and what form that takes and whether the system has the bandwidth to provide that is again, a function of local circumstances sometimes. Uh, but I do kind of like the buddy system sort of approach uh, or the more frequent check-in or the, uh, some, some place where the individual can feel like they're getting support without being sort of uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm missing the word here, but without being humiliated or uh, you know, sort of put in the corner as someone who's special. Uh, right. I, I don't have a brilliant solution. I'm, I'm excited to hear yours. <laughs> well, I, what you're describing is one of the most effective um, tools and that's to engage either uh, a peer or someone who's closer in training um, who's got the skills or whatever uh, behaviors that, that you're looking to uh, help develop. We have a, a tutoring program here for medical students uh, with the residents meeting to go over, you know, brainstem clinical syndromes or imaging. Um, and it really, it's a different thing than meeting with me, for instance, um, where there's uh, just more pressure or the perception of higher stakes. Um, so whenever, and, and likewise in residency, both here and uh, in Boston, I would engage you know, other residents all the time to, um, sometimes it was just uh, a proactive uh, check-in. Um, so other times uh, we had people kind of like just attach at the hip through a shift and um, one of the keys I think is diagnosing where the issue is. So the intervention really depends on why the, pa the, the patient, why the student or resident is struggling. So one of the first things to do is to try to understand that, often starting with the trainee and do they perceive that they're struggling? It's not uncommon that they don't or not fully. So um, that's a, I, sometimes I would engage other residents to help diagnose where the issues were. 
Um, for instance, um, discussions of cases was right on, but when it came down to implement the plan, there was a deer in the headlights, uh, just could not, had a list and did not know where to start on the list. Um, others, you know, there, there's a number of different reasons why this can happen. Um, any other thoughts? Tracy, I, I mean, I, I come at this with a slightly different perspective. Um, one is, I think you have to be really careful about involving peers and shifting that onus onto the peer. And so it takes a certain, even near peers, I think it takes a particular person who wants to do that. And it's, it's I think very, it, it can be very disruptive to the group dynamic among trainees to have somebody who's sort of assigned that responsibility. So I think that's really have to be cautious with. And I would say, um, you know, we always want all everybody we, you know, recruit and accept to succeed. But sometimes, I mean, no admissions process is perfect. And I do think that one has to sort of accept, um, you know, I think back to the very first day of medical school where Dan Fetterman said to my class, welcome to the Alumni Association. And that's probably not the right attitude. There are some people for whom one has to decide that this is not the right place or the right role. And that is where we're very loath to ever do that. But I think we do a disservice to patients. We don't. Um, it's not common, but I think we do have to remember that all the time. Um, thanks, Matthew. Are you on uh, committees that deal with this at the student level? Um, and have you ever been involved where uh, someone was actually um, removed from a program? Um, I'm on it on the, so I chair admissions these days for the HST. I have for, you know, 15 years. Um, and I am, I'm not on the PRB, but I have occasionally presented individuals to the promotion and review board and they have um, left the institution. Yeah, it's, uh, I totally agree. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna let Dr. Headley White um, chime in. Um, go ahead, Dr. Headley White. Well, I had two comments. One is to be sure that there isn't something going on outside the hospital that uh, is, um, and I didn't hear anybody actually mention that. Mm -hmm. And and yes, I have been involved in counseling and trying to sort out whether somebody should t stay in a program or not. And it's, it's extremely difficult. So I symp sympathize with anyone who's had to do it. Thank you, um, absolutely. So, um... I've had uh, a range of responses when, when I've uh, sort of checked in with someone who I perceived to be um, behind the curve. Um, I've had people who were the sole caregiver to an ailing parent. Um, that happened just recently um, that I, I wasn't directly involved, but I heard about it here. Um, there are all kinds of factors, uh, mental health, issues are a big one. Um, so absolutely checking in on, on what other factors that may have nothing to do with their actual competence um, or ability. But as uh, Dr. Frosch points out, there are people who just, no, no matter what you put in place, uh, it's not the right fit. I, have, I heard recently about a, a grad student here who's struggling uh, and they kind of passed through the comps, but now when it's like uh, time to get stuff done and show some independent thought in the lab, it's just not happening. And uh, the person has like other things they like to do and, and they're voting with their feet by going to do this other extracurricular activity. And so I think there are scenarios where you just need to have honest conversations about, you know, are you happy doing this? Do you think this is something that if you put three more years into, you're still not going to want to do it. So uh, we often, uh, there's a lot of stakes and you've invested a lot, but I would say the earlier you come to that conclusion that it's not going to work, the better, both for the institution and the, the trainee, for sure. So I think we covered a lot of this stuff. Um, the first thing I would say is try not to pass the buck. As a program director, I really appreciated when Andy would come into my office when he had an early concern that he tried to give feedback on. Um, 
or when um, Albert would and I would talk in resident clinic about some particular uh, struggle that a, a resident was having. Um, and my first question was, so what did you tell them? Um, and it is really important that it's not a surprise when they meet with the clerkship director or their thesis advisor or the program director um, that there is, um, you know, honest check-ins and feedback given. Um, don't make assumptions. Uh, so I, um, Keith Baker in anesthesia at MGH has given a lot of talks about feedback. And um, one of the things that I picked up from him is the power of just stating what you've observed without placing any judgment on it. For instance, uh, you know, I had a, a student who was habitually late and um, it was easy to think this person is disorganized and lazy when in fact there was a situation with um, a dying family member. Um, so um, just point out the perceptions and the behaviors and don't place judgments. Um, seek to understand what the barriers are to, to the performance. And then this is a big one. I, I learned early on in the program director role that um, it is impossible to, to help all the trainees you know, on your own. And it really takes a team. I learned from other program directors and other departments. I learned from former program directors. Um, I learned from Merit. I learned from Ann. Um, all kinds of um, inputs to help uh, as a team. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, also engaging, I, I agree it can be tricky, um, Dr. Frosch, with uh, engaging your peers. Um, I think sometimes it's like the elephant in the room. They all know this person's struggling already. And their perception is that the program's not doing anything about it. So there are, it does take buy-in from the person who's struggling. So they have to be okay with it. And I would never impose or call them out with their peers without their being on board and consenting. And you have to be careful about how you do it so that it's not shining a bright light with flashing neon sign that this person's remediating. Um, so it is, it is a balance of how to do that. You do have to set clear goals. And if you are at the point where it could be, uh, you know, it's not gonna happen, you really have to establish steps of consequences that get more dire um, so that there's no surprises along the way. And from a practical standpoint, you have to document the stink out of it because um, even when everyone's in agreement, the trainee may, uh, may make a fuss um, and there can be sort of logistical or legal consequences. Um, all right, I'm gonna go into a little bit more complicated waters here. Um, so a patient, and I've got three different bullet points here, but you can fill in the blanks. Um, a patient refers to a female senior resident as a nurse during rounds. Um, a, a, I know that almost every woman, if not every single woman um, has had this experience and none of the men have. Um, I've asked in multiple venues. Um, a, a patient makes comments about the appearance of a female medical team member. Or the last one happened with a resident and me uh, just this past year. Um, patient makes a joke about wanting to marry the female resident who was seeing the patient first before um, the, the resident presents to you. So anyone have thoughts on in any of these scenarios or in general, how to, how to react or, or what, what approaches to take when there is a patient under your care who is making comments or acting in a way that is um, frankly, uh, you know, a, a, not just micro, macro aggression toward any identity. In this case, it is gender-based, but you could fill in the blank with, uh, you know, black or immigrants or disabled. Just 
tricky. Yeah, I, I could make a comment. I, certainly there are things, I guess the first question is, do you talk to the patient or do you talk to the resident? Uh, uh, yes. So uh, there are certainly cases where you absolutely need to talk to the patient. Um, the question is, where are those lines? I mean, if, if a patient physically interacted with, uh, with a member of the, of the staff, um, then you'd have to say, you just can't do that. Uh, these are tricky because there are some people whose cultural sensitivities uh, don't, don't, don't see these kinds of comments, the kinds of things you're, you're, you're described here as being as difficult for uh, the, the person they're referring to as we do. Uh, so we always have to first decide what that line is. That's very difficult. Uh, it, to me, the other question is um, you have to talk to the resident and see how, in this case, she feels about it and whether she wants to do anything. I mean, I, I remember a, a patient who came from a different culture who uh, went like this uh, to uh, all of our residents until I came into the room. Uh, I mean, he, he wasn't there to see residents. Uh, he was there to see the senior attending. Um, he had dementia and there didn't seem to be any point in talking to him about this, but it was important to talk to the residents about how they felt about being dismissed that, that way. A lot of rich points there, um, Dr. Kaplan. Uh, thank you for sharing that, David. Um, I, I don't, there's no right answer for this. I, I think there are, there's framework and this has become something that is being uh, taught and there are trainings around um, patient initiated abuse. Um, but there's a tension because we were all taught and trained that the patient is the, you know, we're here to care for the patients and it's not about our feelings, but it's easy to say uh, for me as a white man and not having experienced this over and over again. Um, and I think one of the points you made, David, about asking the resident in question, um, so just acknowledging it is one thing. Uh, a lot of times uh, it just gets glossed over or laughed off and it's never addressed. Um, you also pointed out that uh, maybe the patient has a executive dysfunction. And is it fair to hold someone like that to, uh, or to react or engage with a, the with a patient in the same way? Um, so complicated issues. Any other thoughts? Anyone who's experienced this um, have, uh, have an example of things that have been helpful or not helpful? I see uh, both Dr. Sakovich and Dr. Um, Mateen on video. Uh, either one of you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I do think this does happen a lot. And it's not just about gender. And we've, we've had incidents where people have, um, you know, maybe refused to see a, a, a physician because of their last name or their uh, background. And we really do have a no tolerance for that. I think the, the caveat is always kind of what David Kaplan mentioned is that many of our patients do have, you know, cognitive disorders. And, 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 but I, I think if someone doesn't have a cognitive disorder, it's really about dressing it with that person and that we don't tolerate that at our hospital, but doing it in a way that you ensure they're still getting their care or you're transferring their care. I know like in the outpatient setting, we have actually trained our PSCs of how to answer if somebody refuses to see someone because of their gender or race. But I, I um, also agree that it's important to talk to, um, you know, the, the people who are or getting these, you know, the, the resident or the student uh, so that you can help them with understanding this and how to approach it themselves with patients um, if it happens when you don't have somebody else around. I think um, Altaf wrote a beautiful paper about this when she was a resident. If, um, if people haven't read that, we could send that around. I highly recommend it. Um, she and I talked about this a lot um, because she, she had the added, you know, factor of um, being Muslim at uh, a time when, obviously, that there's been a lot of uh, patient-based um, aggressions um, towards that identity as well. Um, 
Dr. Mateen uh, Farah. Nice to see you, Tracy. Um, you. So this, you know, these sorts of scenarios happen, unfortunately, very often. Um, but I guess a couple of thoughts came up. So on the consult service, I'm often thought of as like, the student and then the residents often thought of as the attending. And, you know, sometimes um, the resident introduces him or herself as a neurologist, which I've always been a little bit uncertain of whether that's appropriate. But in some cases, that's actually helpful for me to stand back a little bit and let the resident actually take the lead for that patient encounter. And if, and if they do think I'm sort of a, a junior to that person, it, it allows me a different vantage point of observation that I think the resident doesn't always get. So I haven't always felt that was a, was a negative. Um, the other thought I had is that we don't always do a great job of telling our patients who our teams are. <clears throat> and it's, <clears throat> excuse me, not always their fault because of the number of people they're seeing and the assumptions they're making. And, um, and maybe the assumptions may be wrong, but I think we could do a better job of introducing ourselves, telling the teams. Um, and then another thought I had was um, occasionally now we ask patients um, if they prefer a male or a female um, outpatient neurologist when they have a certain diagnosis. And I don't know if we should be doing that or not. Um, so I don't know how much of an interplay we have uh, with some of the scenarios that evolve. Um, thanks, Farah. I was going to point out that my wife, uh, who's a pulmonary critical care attending, um, she has choice things to say when this happens uh, with with when she's attending in the in the ICU and either mistaken for a nurse or um, you know a junior person, even from for instance from ner other nurses, um, turning to the male junior resident when she's in the room as well. Um, in that scenario, everyone's wearing scrubs and and there's not um, a guy in a suit like me who uh, I started doing that explicitly so I wouldn't be. Uh, confused as a, as a senior resident when I first started. Um, so there, there are a lot of structural things that can be done. Um, introducing um, yourself as a certain role or someone else when they notice it, um, saying, well, I defer to my supervisor, Dr. Mateen. Um, there are a lot of different ways that, that it can happen. Um, how is, I'm sorry, this is Diana. I, you know, I, I actually experienced a lot of this during my training. Of course, that was a lot a long time ago, and people are much more aware of microaggressions. But I think I, I wondered about how you rec sort of suggest either for junior faculty or even some of the residents to deal with sort of these sort of sub almost subconscious mi bi microaggressions that are occurring. Um, even today, I'm you know I get on conference calls and. You know, I will say something and it's kind of, you know, dismissed uh, on a call. And then just a few minutes later, one of my male colleagues uh, says basically the same thing. And um, suddenly that becomes a really brilliant idea. Um, and and I, I feel that this is still going on. Uh, maybe it's some of the older folks, because those tend to be the, the kind of the interactions, but even among some of the younger folks. And, and I wonder also about just kind of how you advise your, you know, the, the, the you know, up and coming faculty, women faculty on how to manage these because there are also struggles. Now you have your junior person and it's the senior person who's actually um, engaging these microaggressions more often than not subconsciously. Um, thanks, Dr. Russis, Diana. It's nice to hear from you. Um, I, well, we have experts on this um, far more, um, expert than I am, um, I would definitely turn to Dr. Sokovich and others. Um, we just had Allison Brashear as a guest here uh, virtually this week for our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, grand rounds. And she pointed out this phenomenon. Um, I don't have the, the, the resource in front of me, but there were some women in the uh, Obama White House who noticed this phenomenon of uh, men, uh, having an idea and then a man states the idea and it becomes that man's idea and it goes forward. Um, and she had some suggestions about how uh, amplifying or promoting um, ideas or saying, for instance, in, in your case, um, I think both men and women need to be trained in this. Um, uh, there are different angles, of course, but um, for instance, in the phone call that you were on, it would have been nice if another person, man or woman, had said, oh, I like Diana's idea about this. 
um, and sort of attributing it to you and, and promoting it as um, not just your idea, but a good idea. Um, but you know what's happened, Tracy, is actually the, the man uh, is usually uh, acknowledged as having had the idea by another man. Uh, absolutely. So I don't know. It, it doesn't solve that problem. But rather than uh, just taking the idea, being explicit about it being yours and commending it as a good idea, um, that's not going to stop other men from, you know, doing what happened in your scenario. Um, just as an aside, I didn't suddenly become a formal person who refers to everyone as doctor when I moved to Iowa. I actually have all the residents call me Tracy because I can't, I can only be Ticho um, in Boston. But I've had, um, during the pandemic, I've been on sessions with women where uh, a moderator referred to the men as Dr. So-and-so and the women by their first name. So I, it's, for me, it's a, it's an, it's it, very uh, annoying. It is annoying. I, I can't imagine. I don't know what it's like, but um, so if you're wondering why I'm suddenly calling you Dr. So-and-so, that's why it's not because um, I talk that way normally. <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Sokovich, thoughts, advice? Yeah, I think you gave the best advice. And I have to say that um, I, I learned that in one of these courses and, and do that and other women leaders in the hospital do that, but it, you have to you know, it, it's really important. It's going to take a long time to change kind of that that approach. But we, um, and, you know, we don't have to be women supporting women. It could be men supporting women and vice versa. But it's important to um, kind of be there for your colleagues if you see that something like that happening for people. So somehow we are um, already at the end of the hour. I'm just going to wrap this one up. Um, I think you have to use your judgment about the patient's state and take that into account, but it is important to call it out uh, with the group and debrief. Um, absolutely engage the person who is the recipient of the behavior. Um, I'm just gonna skip to some of the lessons that I've learned. And one of the big ones is that um, I had so many mentors, I could not put everyone acknowledge specifically what I learned, but I just want to give you some examples of how my style of teaching and, and um, leading has been influenced. So uh, Dr. Venna taught me to be present, to keep the door open all the time, to reframe and nudge in the right direction, to encourage independence and to collaborate across disciplines. Ann Young taught me to advocate fiercely, to delegate, to, to sponsor, and to empower. As a, I was like in my third year to faculty when uh, Dave Greer left and I took on the, the role and basically Ann just said, this is the guy um, and had me at the table with um, all the more senior people. And, and I've I really uh, appreciated that and try to do that for others. Um, Marty Samuels uh, taught me how to try to inspire with a passion for neurology to sponsor and promote and to learn from mistakes. Merit Sakovich has taught me to, how to set high expectations. Um, nothing was going to be handed to me, but there was a clear path for, for developing as an educational leader and a clinical leader. And then she taught me how to empower and support people to reach those goals. Um, she also taught me how to collaborate. I've modeled a lot of what I've tried to do here in a, starting a neuroimmunology division based on team building and collaboration that I learned from her. Uh, Dr. Schmalman taught me, uh, you have to be a clinician before you can be a teacher. You have to know your stuff and take care of the patients. Uh, Tracy Milligan taught me how to listen first, to lead both in and out of the spotlight. So Shank Prasad taught me how to bring passion and enthusiasm to expect and to develop excellence and how to adapt. I haven't quite gotten the yoga down yet, but um, I'm working on it. Mike Bali taught me how to get stuff done, how to know when to be serious and when to laugh at yourself and how to be all in when you commit to something. And Sylvia Eden has taught me how to navigate disasters with grace, how to manage with a smile and how to advocate fiercely, which she does for every resident all the time. Thank you very much for having me back. I wish it were in person and I hope to 
see all of you in person soon. What do you want? I want to say something. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much, see. Dr. Cho, for the great discussion. Um, I think especially apt as we are in July and have a new set of trainees and people taking on new roles. Uh, we appreciate you being here with us. Thank you again for the invitation and I uh, hope to see all of you soon. Take care, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy.